just to let a few more people um, join. And uh, then we'll begin the training on uh, Streamer RT, the Streamer RT product. You should see a map of the Southeast US now with some data layers on it. Um, if you cannot um, see this, uh, please uh, message us in the chat window um, and we'll uh, address it as uh, needed. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate uh, you giving us some time this afternoon to allow us uh, here at Earth Networks to uh, train you on our visualization software, Streamer RT. Um, I have a number of uh, things to go through here. Uh, during the course of the training, uh, feel free to uh, type in any questions into the chat window. I'll do my best to uh, answer them either along the way or at the end of the training. Um, one of the things that um, I want to go over here real quick is just kind of the itinerary, the rundown for the training. Uh, first, what I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some of the basic functionality of StreamRT, some of the terminology, uh, so familiarize you with some terms with, uh, to, uh, as I go through the training, uh, they won't feel, seem foreign to you. Uh, I'll review the navigation on the product. Um, and go over navigating the map and some of the map tools. I'll talk about adding layers and querying uh, data layers in the uh, in StreamRT. Then I'll go over um, a couple of uh, function functionalities in the product that would be helpful to you. One would be saving preset views. Another is uh, setting up notifications. Um, and then um, I'll go over some of the important data layers and uh, plots. Um, that will interest you. Obviously, the lightning data will be focused on mostly there, and then at the end, I'll uh, take questions. Okay, everyone, sorry about that. I had a little audio issue just briefly. Anyway, um, 
what I want to uh, start out with here is just go over some of the basic functionality of uh, StreamRT right now. You're uh, looking at uh, StreamRT, the visualization software, um, and what I'll go through here is just uh, talk about some of the things uh, to be aware of on the program. On the right side here, you'll see a, a small bar with an arrow. Uh, this indicates uh, that there is a, a data pane. This is what we call our data pane of the product. It pops in and out. Um, you can um, have it off when you get your data layer set up. Uh, when it's open, it displays the various data layers uh, that are currently plotted on the map. You can see here that I have some lightning data. Um, I have some plots of current temperatures, some border files, uh, radar, IR satellite, and uh, National Weather Service alerts as well. Um, one, one thing that's important with this layer is that this is where you uh, can order uh, how the layers show. So if I want the radar to be beneath the satellite image, I can click on it and drag it, and you'll see that it'll go below the satellite image, and when I bring it up, it goes above it. What I also is important is that the very top layer in the list is the queryable, queryable data layer. Um, many of the data layers that display have the ability to query more information on the data itself. So, for example, if I take the temperature plots to the top, this layer is now queryable, and you can see that if I scroll over one of these, um, I am able to click on the, the, the station uh, data there and get a whole list of uh, more information. This uh, information here is called the map tip. There are map, uh, there's a lot of map tip information you can click on um, to query uh, station data. You can click on to query uh, alert data, information about individual lightning strikes and such. And those are things that you would want to uh, experiment around with. Not every data layer does have a map tip, like contours do not have map tips, but uh, every plot will have a map, map tip, and especially plotted data like lightning um, and tropicals data and things like that will have um, map tips. But again, it's uh, the layer you would want to uh, move to the top in the data pane, and that makes it queryable. Now, most map tips have a uh, detail window, which opens what we call uh, the dashboard, which uh, displays even more information. It displays uh, station information about the location. It also has uh, some uh, climate data where you can go back and look at observations from any location. And then we also feature the National Weather Service forecast here. Um, you're able to click on um, any of those and see the forecast um, on there as well. So that this is the dashboard. It's the details link off the map tip, which is queryable off the uh, top data layer in the data pane. So those are uh, some important uh, items to know about um, some terms and things I'll talk about here. One thing is you can you can clear all the data layers, and adding data layers is as simple as going into the navigation at the top here and clicking on uh, what you want to show in the product. So this it's very easy to click and it'll it'll quickly show um, in the in the data pane here. And then you can also layer things as as needed there as well, as I previously showed there. Now, what I want to go through is some of the uh, navigation. Uh, there is uh, navigation on the very top right here. Um, you see where my mouse cursor is way up in the top here. Uh, there's your logout link. There is a feedback link for asking questions and getting general information. You can also uh, ask, uh, change it to Spanish if that's a better uh, language for you to use. Um, it defaults open on English uh, for your logins. So, the other uh, navigations, uh, there are some navigations across the top here, which I will get into a little bit of detail about uh, later, but uh, these are areas where you can set uh, settings up on the units and the date time format. Those are defaulted to English and U uh, North American day time formats. 
probably no reason for you to change those. Um, there's also uh, a, a uh, links to set preset views, which I'll talk about in a minute, and also notifications, which I'll also talk about later in later in the uh, presentation here. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the navig uh, some of the other functions here on the menu on the navigation. This is the uh, the navigation that allows you to move in and out of the map. Um, you can use the plus to zoom in. Um, you'll see in the upper uh, corner here there's zoom levels. There's zoom levels uh, down to zoom level 11. And then you can zoom out. You can also use the box a tool to drag a, a box over an area that you want to zoom in on. Um, and then there is a uh, view which will bring you about back out to the full extent view um, as well. You can also use the um, the navigations to to pan to the left and right easily also north and south as well. So those are uh, some items that you can uh, make use of. Uh, the, the tools in the blue to the uh, to the left, uh, to the right of those navigation tools are uh, drawing tools. Uh, for example, let's say you wanted to do a, uh, put a, a radius around a certain location. You can drag it out. Uh, to the size that you want to have, if you want to know when uh, things are within 50 miles of a location, like I've set up there, and that will stay with the map as long as you have it open. Um, even when you zoom out, it'll stay in the same location. Uh, those that that tool is handy for um, for setting up uh, preset views, which I'll. Uh, Again, talk about a little later. You can set up preset views with certain radiuses on it uh, for monitoring certain um, uh, weather situations, such as approaching lightning and things like that. Um, the other uh, item I want to uh, go over here is actually the uh, the line tool. Um, there's a tool in here which you can use to uh, see how far things away are from a location. For example, uh, how far is the lightning here from Lakeland? I can drag a line out there and see quickly it's 46.8 uh, miles away uh, to the north northeast of Lakeland. So uh, that could be handy as well. And um, you can erase any lines by just clicking on the eraser up here and then clicking on the line and it will take the line off um, if you don't want it on the map anymore. So those are some of the navigation tools, some of the functionality. Um, what I do want to go back to um, uh, real quick here is just the adding of the data layers um, and go through some of the, the layers on the map. So for example, I set up a view here earlier, but um, what I'll do is I'll go through and set up a view um, by adding some data layers and navigating around so you can see how that would be done. Um, starting with a blank view. Um, let's say I want to save a view um, over Tampa. I can use the the zoom uh, view to, to center my map on where I will want it. And then I uh, I can go into uh, the different layers here. For example, um, I'm going to go in and add in um, the two minute uh, wind speed and direction and a temperature contour. Um, borders are uh, good to add that are, are useful for references. Uh, we can add the state borders and the county borders there over this. Um, and then let's say I'll add uh, some uh, lightning and uh, the radar mosaic. So if I go over to uh, the the map pane now, you'll see that it is showing all the layers that I, I have added. Um, there is some smart layering to the program, so you can see that the plots are put on top of the radar and the borders are put on top of the radar. But for example, let's say I, I didn't want the, uh, 
the uh, plots uh, above the radar. I wanted them below the radar. I could move it and drop it in there um, and easily uh, move things around into the to the order that I'd, I'd want them. So you, you'll want to uh, play around with uh, some of the, the data that's available. There's various tropical data. Uh, most importantly, we'll talk about this, the, the lightning um, and lightning cell tracks and that information um, will be the main uh, data layer that I'll concentrate on when we get to that point. But let's say this is your view that you would like to save. This is the view that you would want to um, reference on a regular basis. Um, saving views is very simple. You set them up like I just uh, went through there, order it how you want it. Um, if you wanted it to be a slightly wider extent, you could set it up for that. Um, and what you would do is go to the navigation in the upper right, and there's a link up here that says Views. And if I click on that, and then I go to New View. I can save a view, and I'll just call this Tampa, and hit OK. And the product uh, saves the view. It also redisplays my default view. Um, but up here in the on the uh, bottom navigation here, you'll see a list of um, my preset views. Some of my preset views. And uh, Tampa has been added to that list. Now, if I click on that, there it is. It's uh, exactly uh, how I had left it. Uh, one of the things of note that if I wanted to put a a 50 mile radius around Tampa as well, I could uh, draw a circle to 50 miles. I could go back into views, and this time I want to replace an existing view. And Tampa is in that list, and I click on Tampa, and I hit OK. And now that view will also have that drawing, uh, the, the radius saved on the uh, Tampa view that I've saved. And this will be on there every time. So you can put various range rings um, on the map um, for different mileages, um, just for reference. Uh, quick quick reference on how far things would be away from certain locations. So that's handy things to do to set up some views um, for you to use some of the data layers that are important to you uh, for the locations that are important to you. The next thing I want to go over that uh, would be a useful item um, to use are notifications. Uh, notifications essentially are um, uh, locations that are set up to monitor certain weather uh, elements uh, reaching certain thresholds, such as temperature levels or distances from a location. Um, and what they can do is they will auto alert you or visually alert you or email alert you uh, based on um, the notification that has been set up. So for example, what I'll do is I'll set up a lightning notification for this uh, area around Tampa. I click on the Edit Notifications link here, and one of the things um, I'll do is create a new location. Now this location I'm going to center over Tampa. I want it to be a uh, lat lawn, because I'm going to click on a point and I'll name it Tampa. And what I want to do here is I'm going to make it a 50 mile radius. And what I'll do is I'll go down here, I'll hit the radio button for radius, and when I click on the point here, the point for Tampa, and what I can do here is I'll turn off the, the contour. That's one thing you can do in the data pane here is you can, you can turn layers off and on. You can also change the opacities um, easily. So if you don't want something showing uh, for a few minutes while you look at something else, you can turn them off in the data pane. So here I'll click on Tampa now that I've cleared it up and you can see the point where Tampa is. I've clicked on Tampa and I'm going to put in a 50 mile radius and I'll hit save. 
And now, added to the bottom of the list, I'll see that I have a new uh, notification location called Tampa 50 Mile Radius. Now I need to set up a rule for this. Uh, notifications, as I mentioned, can be set up to uh, alert you for temperatures exceeding certain thresholds, going below certain levels or above. And any of the data plot values are in here. You can set uh, for, for rain rates to be alerted for rain rates greater than two inches per hour um, and things like that. What I want to do is start off with lightning. I'll click on the lightning tab. I'll select that data layer. Now the refresh uh, duration on these, this alert is set at 30 minutes. I could change that to 20 minutes or 60 minutes. This would be how often you would uh, receive uh, an update that the notification was still in effect. Uh, for, for this one, I'll just do 30. I'll use the default. And if I double click on the arrow, it puts it into the rule list on the right. And this is a 30 minute lightning rule. Uh, and I'm going to name it for 50 miles. Um, just so I know when I get alerted, I, I know exactly uh, what the, the alert is for. Um, you can set, select six different audio notifications. Um, I'll select the peacock sound. And then for the uh, email, you can put one email address in. These can be group emails or single emails. Um, I will put in my email here. And then save it. And so now I have a um, rule set up for lightning within 30 miles of camp, uh, with, with, for lightning within 50 miles of Tampa. Now, incidentally, I have just received a email alert for this. You can see this is an email I just got in my inbox as soon as I set that up. Um, lightning is occurring within 50 miles, and this tells me that the, the rule has been satisfied. 15.85 um, miles away from um, the center of that location was the stroke, and it gives me some other information on the lightning and inner cloud strike with a current and an activation time. That went into my inbox. Now, if I close out these notifications, one of the things you'll notice is up here, there's a blinking uh, link, custom notifications, one of 19. What this is telling me when it blinks and it's red is that there is a new notification um, that has been monitored that's been satisfied, the rule has been satisfied, and it's, it's become an active uh, notification. And in the last 24 hours, there's been 19. Only one of them is currently active. Now, if I click on that link, you'll see it stops blinking, and the link turns black, and the window opens here, much like an email um, program might. It has uh, the notification here, and it's in bold, indicating I haven't read it. Now, if I click on that, you'll see it unbolds it, and here is the notification details that were actually emailed to me are also now in the product. Now, this will show in the active tab for um, 30 minutes, and if there continues to be lightning within 50 miles, it will be reissued and continue to show in the active tab um, for another 30 minutes after that. So those are useful uh, for monitoring data. You don't, it allows you to not have the program right in front of you to, to monitor uh, situations uh, around uh, various uh, areas of interest you might have. Um, also be able to send emails to your smartphones to notify you that um, if you're concerned about the first lightning uh, developing within a certain distance of your location, it would be um, very uh, easy to use that, or peak wind gusts within the region, um, heat indices, or temperature thresholds are always uh, uh, 
handy notifications to set up, uh, especially for our clients. Okay, so that is our two of the uh, more relevant functions that I'll, I'll, I'll tra I've trained you on here. And again, there in the upper right, you got your views to set up the preset views. Um, you can set up as many as you want. Um, there is a limit to how many will show on this bar here. Um, I find that I can, um, I generally use about three or four different views um, on a regular basis. So um, you can set those up and then notifications would be uh, handy to, to play around with those and set up various notifications um, um, to get a feel for how those work. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm going to clear off um, all the uh, layers here and I have a, a view set up here. I'm going to go over some of the data layers and primarily what I'm going to go through um, will be the uh, lightning information. The, um, the map, there's various map layers for overlayers, overlays. Um, you, your uh, logins will be able to do U.S. County, state, and uh, international borders. Um, we have a, a alerting uh, for a number of countries. Of course, we have your National Weather Service alerts, um, which are uh, in this data layer. There's also a uh, custom notifications layer, which shows you uh, the areas where you have notification locations set up. Uh, this one I set up is over Tampa, and you can see it uh, located there. Again, a whole list of current weather data that you can uh, show in plots or in contours. There's forecast uh, data layers. Uh, these would be the uh, NVFD um, um, contours uh, for current temperature and the seven-day outlooks uh, for low and high temperatures. Um, and then we also have uh, various radar and satellite imagery and um, under severe is where the lightning data is, and that's what I'll uh, talk about right now. So if I go to severe, I'm going to turn on the uh, total lightning, and I'll, I'm going to also talk about cell tracks and uh, uh, polygons, um, which we have as uh, called the uh, dangerous thunderstorm alert. And we have very we have uh, other levels of polygons based on flash rates that are uh, important for uh, just tracking the direction of various storms. Um, there isn't a whole lot of activity around uh, the country, as you all uh, very much know, as far as lightning. Um, we're seeing a little bit of, of lightning that's uh, occurring at rates that is trackable uh, currently off the uh, Florida coast. Uh, what this will show you is that um, what I want to go through is the, uh, the, first of all, the total lightning layer, which I will bring up to the top here. Um, now this layer displays the, um, the lightning, both in cloud and cloud to ground from the, uh, total, uh, the Earth Network's total lightning network. You can also display flashes or strokes, um, strokes being the, um, the, the individual uh, discharges of a, of a single flash. Um, when you click on strokes, you'll see that there are more located than on flashes. Um, flashes um, are the default. You can also set to look at uh, strokes in the last 15, 30, or 60 minutes. The lightning data is also, you're able to animate it. You can animate it um, for one hour or three hours, and of course there's a legend which describes what you're seeing. We have cloud to ground strikes are, the current most latest cloud to ground strikes are in yellow. The most latest one minute strikes for in cloud are in magenta and show as a dumbbell uh, symbol. And then um, the various colors for the age of the strikes is as you animated, are shown here as well. Now, if I go back, let's go back to the uh, one-minute lightning. And for example, there's uh, 
there are there is data that's queryable uh, on these strikes. If I go into uh, Zoom level nine here, you can see that there's some uh, strikes here. Uh, I see strikes around Lake County. There's one CG negative CG strike uh, here as well. But these also have map tips. You can click on on them. Clicking on the uh, details for the dashboard window will display all the uh, flashes or strokes that are on the map currently. Um, these tables are uh, downloadable if you wanted to take the data to a spreadsheet and do further analysis. Uh, you can uh, do that as well. So that's the information you can gather on the lightning. And, and again, if I uh, change it to 15 minutes, I can still query on older lightning data. And again, I'll get more lightning data in the uh, dashboard window that I can download um, if I uh, so choose. So that's the uh, the lightning data layer. The other uh, layers that I have on here uh, are the uh, total lightning cell tracks. And what this is, and unfortunately we don't have a, a whole lot of examples here to show um, because of the lack of uh, lightning around the area, but the cell tracks actually um, is an automated algorithm that we use to uh, monitor to group cluster lightning and then track them as cells, the lightning cell, the core of the cell uh, with the updraft is, is uh, located by some clustering algorithms which take the lightning and, and once the lightning reaches two strikes, uh, more than two flashes per minute, it begins to be tracked. These tracks are clickable too. Uh, you can see the history of a cell by uh, clicking on the, the cell track. And if I open the, uh, the dashboard window for the cell, I can see the history of it. I can see that um, at one point this cell was uh, over 12 flashes per uh, minute and it underwent a few cycles here. Uh, the, the color being the total rate is in green, the IC rate is red, and the CG rate is in orange. And that data is also displayed on the left side for the cell track, and it's exportable by copying the table out to uh, another spreadsheet program you may use. So that that's a a way to track uh, the cells. You can see that um, the cell tracks have dots on them. This is uh, the, the cell tracks are recalculated every minute. Um, there's a running five minute average done um, for the speed and direction on the cell. And essentially, as long as it has more than two flashes per minute, it will be color coded. And the black indicates the storm had gone down below uh, three flashes per minute, and then it essentially died. So there's really no, uh, uh, right now there's no cell tracks, active cell tracks in North America because the the cell, the radar does not show any lightning that's uh, occurring in more than three flashes per minute. Well, actually there is one up here. Now this storm has gotten a little bit active. I can use this as an example, but there is a, there's a cell here in Lake County that is uh, being clustered into a lightning cell. That's the polygon here around this cell. It's being um, it's being averaged into a uh, cell with a direction to the northeast. Um, there are corrections done on the, the algorithms that uses the directional skips from the 88V. So Early cells with less than five minutes of history will use the 88B storm motions. Um, and then once the cell has a history, the uh, 
uh, lightning cell motion will uh, be weighted toward the actual uh, core of the lightning cell direction and speed. And so this uh, storm, again, it can be clicked on. I can see that um, Let me see if I can get some data from this cell. It's a, a new cell. It's uh, moving to the northeast, and um, it has showing uh, in the orange. If I put the legend on, uh, it's greater than 12 uh, flashes per minute. Um, it, it's quickly gone from um, a lower level to over 12, uh, so it's a increasing in uh, intensity at this time. Now, the directional polygons can also be uh, turned on here. These are based on the speed and direction um, calculated from the storm vector uh, or the, uh, the vector for the uh, lightning cell. Um, the green is, shows the motion of the storm uh, anticipated over the next 45 minutes. The, the, the length of this polygon is in time. So this is a 45 minute uh, duration uh, polygon for this cell. And the uh, 12 minute one is, is very close to the same, uh, same speed and direction. So it is, it is almost laying right over the, the level one. But these are for tracking purposes. Um, they are not our dangerous thunderstorm alerts. Um, so we're, uh, if it were to go over 25, there would be a dangerous thunderstorm, um, automated dangerous thunderstorm alert um, issued here for this uh, lightning, this cell here um, that's exhibiting this lightning activity. So that's um, the information around that, those polygons. Um, I guess there might be uh, some questions that have, um, uh, come in, and so I can uh, answer them in a in a moment here. Uh, but essentially, just to review the lightning uh, data again, you'll find it under severe. The first tab is lightning, and then there are three data layers uh, that you can select. The cell tracks are the uh, dotted tracks here um, that will um, show the history of the storm. And the direction, um, the total lightning is the uh, are the lightning uh, uh, flashes themselves. Again, all queryable and color coded um, to indicate um, these are all in the last minute currently, as I have shown here. And then both showing in cloud and cloud to ground. And then there's the uh, polygons that. Um, are automatically generated. The polygons are, are regenerated, recalculated every 15 minutes. Um, and uh, so each, uh, each time the, the cell is assessed, if it's still over a certain level, a new polygon will be generated. Maybe a slightly different direction or speed, but um, that's. Um, that's how we uh, recalculate the um, the uh, polygons. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do now is take some questions. Um, and um, so if you can go ahead, you can if you can go ahead and just type them in. I'll I'll start to uh, go down through questions. If there's any questions about the data layers or using the system. Um, then um, I can uh, see what I can do to address them. This is Patrick, uh, the project manager. I see that Stephen Zubrick uh, raised his hand. Uh, Stephen, you're unmuted. I see from this question uh, panel here. Uh, he's asking, "What is what are the what is the aerial extent of the 
of what constitutes a cell for tracking purposes? Is it a four kilometer radius circle? The, the cell is, de is determined by the clustering of the, um, of the lightning over a, over a five minute period. Um, the clustering out algorithm, it can vary. Um, if the lightning is occurring in a very tight area, it can, the cell itself could be um, 50 square miles. Some of them can get high, as high as, uh, you know, over 200 square miles. Um, this one, for example, is 29.2. Uh, this is actually kilometers squared. It says meters squared, but it's kilometers squared. So um, it all depends on how the how big this the uh, area of clustered uh, lightning is. Um, what we do do with the algorithm is that we limit the size, so it will break some cells into two individual cells. Um, this occurs uh, when the the square kilometers uh, gets over 250 square kilometers, uh, then the algorithm will um, essentially uh, begin tracking a, a different cell uh, associated with the wide area of lightning. So here on the screen you can see that there's two, two cells being tracked, essentially moving um, to the northeast. Now, one thing about this cell is what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring up the details for this one. And you can see it, it has a very short history at this point. It's only four minutes. Um, but there is a, um, um, it, it's had lightning rates above 10 uh, flashes per minute uh, during that time period. We have another question from Jonathan. Place or the cell tracks algorithm only uses the EN data and the skip from the radar, correct? Yeah, the cell tracks are only using the total lightning data. Um, early on, the cell, like um, I mentioned, the cell does have some bounds checks. Um, what I sometimes I call sanity checks on them against the ADAB. Uh, the closest uh, skips, the radar skips, but it will, once it has a, a history, it will uh, default to the actual track of the lightning cell as opposed to the skip. Now, if there's a big deviation there, there's some logic in it that keeps the automated program from generating polygons that are um, way outside the bounds of the skips. Um, merging of cells, as you know, um, or redevelopment on on uh, outflows can create some odd occurrences with uh, estimating storm motions, as you know from the skit sometimes. And we have some checks on there to, to balance those out to keep the automated system from um, generating um, skewed polygons uh, based on the direction and speed. I've got another question here from um, Jeffrey Hovis, which is uh, who is actually trying to log into the system. Uh, I, I'm unable to display anything because the base maps are not being displayed. Do I need anything special to get the base maps to display? I'm wondering if that's related to Internet Explorer. Yeah, um, that is important. Uh, the, currently, StreamRT uh, operates in IE, and so. You will not see maps if you're using Firefox or um, one of the other uh, browsers. Um, you'll have to open it in IE. We do have on our project roadmap for the coming year compatibility with um, other browsers and uh, are going to work toward uh, making it more compatible. But currently, you'd have to use IE. And hey, Mark, did yeah, we got another question? Mark, this is Bill Callahan. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hi, Bill. Okay, hey. Uh, for everybody else on the line, this is Bill Callahan. I'm, I'm with Earth Networks as well. 
and uh, the primary liaison to the uh, to the program office with uh, with Harold Daly and, and Pete Rohr. And um, what, what additional thing I wanted to say on that is um, uh, beyond what you said, Mark, in terms of us uh, working towards ensuring further compatibility with other browsers. But um, there are there, there is a plugin that can be um, downloaded, and uh, Patrick, I think you tested this out as have others in our organization to uh, to make sure Chrome and Firefox um, are compatible. We don't support that, and we don't um, we can't 100% guarantee it, but it could be a stopgap measure in the interim uh, if the individual. WFOs or regions, um, IBIT managers allow for for that type of thing to to happen within the offices. That is an option in the interim. And uh, I guess the last thing I'll say on that is, is we did provide a link to that plugin. Um, yeah, it's called ietab.net. Okay, ietab.net. Yeah, it works with Firefox and Chrome. Thanks, Bill. And one of the things you noted, you reminded me about, was uh, just that um, the Streamer RT is the interface to to view the total lightning, um, while the National Weather Service uh, does the necessary work toward integrating the data feed into uh, AWIS and other uh, other channels. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let me let me say a word on that too for everyone else's uh, edification. So, the reason we're doing this training on Streamer is again, it's a, you can consider Streamer sort of a bridge um, towards you having access to this data on your mainline graphics system, your AWIP systems uh, within your offices. Uh, right now, the the Weather Service is not um, in position to ingest ingest our streaming. Total lightning data stream uh, into the talk and then ultimately over the uh, teleport SPN and, and into the AWIPS system. So uh, I'm working right now with um, uh, with headquarters folks on um, uh, requirements that they are still defining for the data stream itself that they would like us to adhere to and include encryption and things like that. At the same time, I believe, that, and I cannot speak, and I, and I'm, I want to caveat that I'm not speaking for the, the weather service folks, Harold or, or Pete. Um, but what they have told me is, at this point, you know, there are certain requirements and being defined internally uh, in order to make the modifications to internal weather service systems from the talk all the way down through the AWIP system to be able to handle total lightning data, streaming total lightning data, and to visualize it in a variety of different ways. Uh, so until then, this streamer product is being provided to you all, so at least you have access to the data. Uh, and I think Mark, you've done a very good job of of, of highlighting the uh, the the various uh, capabilities that streamer has for visualizing the data. I think you've only scratched the surface. Uh, a lot of our primary um, commercial customers and local uh, state and local um, emergency management folks. Who have access to this um, uh, utilize it. So it is um, is a system that we utilize for servicing uh, our operational customers, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to put it to good use. We certainly want you to use it to its full extent. Um, if 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 from this it's desired additional training, um, we will we will certainly try to accommodate that. We have. We have recorded this as well, and we'll make it available so that if you want to do a quick refresher, you'll be able to download the, um, uh, the, the file, the video file, video and audio file, movie file, if you will, and, uh, and take the refresher or give it to anybody else who has not been able to attend. But if you desire more in-depth training on the tool so that you can utilize it more to its maximum extent, um, then I would say, you know, please do that or send us direct feedback or, or funnel it through Harold and and Pete and and we will try to accommodate that in a in a future session. So uh, so uh, thank you all again for your time today. And uh, I'm not bringing this to a close. There certainly may be additional questions that, that people have out there, but I I did want to get in this um, uh, this additional information to you. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Bill. Uh, yes, I actually do have some other questions, uh, Al. Uh, 
Patricia um, is asking, when will our usernames and passwords work to enter the website? Um, you should have uh, all of your usernames and passwords in your possession now. Um, I, uh, Peter uh, Rohr actually has the ones that uh, he requested that I create for him. There are about 160 of you. So I would uh, direct your, your question to them. You, I don't recognize, I actually created all of these things. I don't particularly recognize your name. Uh, perhaps you're under like a, an office or a storm prediction center user ID. Yeah. Um, a question so Patrick, you might, you might want to yep. elaborate on that for a quick second. Um, I don't think we've given a lot of individuals there. Uh, I don't think we've created so many passwords or user credentials on an individual basis. Was it not done on an office basis? No, it was actually the bulk of it was a first name, last name. Okay. And, uh, and, and uh, perhaps 20 that were anonymous, let's say they're like NWS, FPC, or something like that. Okay, so I, what I would say um, to everybody in individual offices, if there are additional credentials needed, um, you please um, work that back through uh, Pete Rohr, and, uh, and he will coordinate with us on, on getting those established. Okay, I got your answer, Al. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up in, uh, in our database to see exactly what uh, Pleasant Hill has in terms of a username. Uh, question from Aaron. Um, what is our definition? Uh, what's the, our difference between a flash and a stroke? Mark, maybe you have that answer. Bill? Okay, so the flash, um, the, the flash is essentially the um, um, aggregate of all the strokes that make up a single lightning flash. Um, the, 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 the discharges are, are, from a stroke perspective, are unique to a flash. And so the flashes will give uh, a wider area and, more, and in more numbers um, plots on the map. For example, if I, if I stop this from animating and I change it to strokes, you'll see that there's um, additional items plotted on the map as opposed to just flashes. And, and essentially, a flash is the central location of all the associated strokes. I think another way to explain that, Mark, and, um, and I will preface or caveat my answer by saying none of us on this call on the Earth Network side are lightning scientists. So uh, you're not going to get the most technical or accurate answer to that question. Uh, we'll be happy to provide one um, if, if desired. Um, we can certainly query our, uh, our lightning scientists to give us the true technical answer to this. But my um, more uh, layman's understanding uh, of that is, uh, and building on what Mark said, is if you were thinking, think about it as pulses, um, a lightning flash is comprised of a variety of pulses that um, move up and down the channel for any particular flash event. And those various pulses are recorded and um, uh, they're plotted. And because they happen at different times and at different intensities and are um, recorded by a number of different um, sensors, individual sensors, they might be actually plotted on a map uh, not in the exact same location. Um, and that's why what, what Mark just said is when you, uh, when you click on strokes, you see a lot more of them actually pop up. So what happens in the flash algorithm, though, is, is because they all happen within a certain um, period of time, and, and that's, I think, counted in nanoseconds type of time frame, they're then grouped into a particular flash. So a flash is, is comprised of a series of pulses which are mapped as strokes. And I guess that's about as good as I could explain it. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Question Bill. Mike Evans. Where do I see the current time on the display that you're showing right now? Um, the time is actually uh, assigned to the data layers. So uh, there's not a time per se on the product, but if you look at the data layers, you can see that there's update times in the uh, lower right corner because each lit data layer has a different time. Um, we do 
have with respect to time the data layers are referenced in UTC um, although uh, some of the data plot information you'll notice that when you query uh, plot data um, you'll see the local time for the observation as well as the UTC time. Okay, thanks. Um, just to go to the last question. You know, then, oh, and, uh, uh, one, one, other, one other thing, querying the data with the map tip will also show the time for that element. So even though you, you're seeing the last minute of lightning on here, if I were to query each of those individual flashes, it would all have slightly different times on them as well. Hey Mark, one thing I might you might want to emphasize because I'm not sure you said it in in black and white earlier um, is the fact that you need to move the layer to the top of the uh, of the side panel in order to use the map tip. Yeah, yeah, I covered that um, in the very beginning as um, when I went over the basic functions. Okay. Yeah. So if I want to query the uh, polygons, drag it like that. Or just the lightning in general, like that. Okay. Again, that's Thank you. Yep. Okay. A uh, question from Philip Bothwell about the um, who can SBC work with at Earth Networks to set up a real time streaming feed of lightning data for our operations? I think, Bill, you may have answered that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, we actually have a, a real time feed and have <laughs> for, I think, almost going on two years now, uh, going into Norman. Um, I set it up with uh, uh, through Don McGorman and uh, a couple of folks that work with and perhaps for him. Uh, so we have a feed that's going in there, um, and I, I often view SPC, NSSL, and Norman WFO kind of all uh, since you're kind of co-located as as being uh, not the same entity. No one offend, offend anybody or, or misspeak, but you're kind of all co-located and, and work together in the same area. So if that's not sufficient, we'll be certainly happy to set up a separate one um, to you. But if if that's going to work for you, if the data is accessible to you on one of the systems that NSSL um, owns and operates, so to speak, then that may be the best first place for for you to go. I know the gentleman, I, I, I cannot pronounce his last name, but Lack is uh, the individual that um, I personally worked with on setting up that data feed some time ago, and, and, and I have spoken with him recently. I know Alex Fierro um, ha, has access to the data and utilizes it in his numerical weather prediction assimilation schemes. So um, if, if that doesn't work for you, uh, please feel free to email me directly, B. Callahan at earthnetworks.com, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, we've got about two more minutes left, so I'll take the last two questions here. Are we able to sell, set up multiple alerts to send emails to various persons who would be working at a radar slash aviation desk? Are these alerts able to be turned on or off at the end of a shift with a new person coming in? Yeah. The Specific notifications can be set up for individuals uh, that may be just interest to them. And yes, they, they can all be turned off. If I can quick, I'll quickly show you this, but um, all the rules have an on and off switch here. And I can go down and turn them off and on. It, there could be seasonal alerts you'll want to turn off and on as well. I use this all the time. And that's a good point. I didn't mention that. Pete. Um, you can set up the rules that apply to only certain people and have them turn them on and off as they need them. Okay, and last question from uh, Leslie uh, Lemon. Is there an online student guide covering all of this information? Yes, we have a, a user guide for Streamer RT. Um, Patrick, along with uh, the, the video link, um, when this is clean, we probably would want to send the link for that PDF user manual. Okay. Well, I can do that. Um, I think there's some other questions um, that are in, but uh, not too much. Oh, what is the refresh rate of the data on the display? Our last question. Okay, then. Uh, I think the it may have been answered by the other. Right. The data all, all refresh, refreshes once a minute automatically. But I can refresh it by just slightly moving the map. will force a refresh. Um, and new data 
can update. I mean, the lightning um, is updating every second, so essentially you can see new lightning data every second. Um, other data obviously won't update that frequently, so it won't produce any difference, but auto, auto updates, refreshes are every minute. Um, and last question we're going to take from Phil Bothwell again. Uh, are there functions that should be avoided because it may slow down the system to a crawl? Also, what happens if more than one forecaster logs in with the same user ID? Okay. Um, the only thing I can say about the speed is that um, if there's a whole lot of lightning on the map, imagine, you know, 10, 15,000 strikes or something, um, and you query, you either go to the archive or you query individual information um, off uh, the data pane. Um, occasionally, the display of the, of the various windows can um, ultimately um, create a longer period of, of refresh or display of the data. So, but otherwise, um, you can have as many layers as you want displayed. Um, it shouldn't be any noticeable speed differences um, with the data you have on clearing the archive. Um, if it's a, a large amount of data, it could be uh, slow. And then the user, oh, yeah. user um, account. Uh, yeah, how many okay. can, can more than one well, sign well, in with an account? Multiple users can use the same account at the same time. The only thing that is effective there is if the users are um, manipulating and saving views, um, you can and would um, change people's views that they may have set up so that you have to be careful about um, if people have multiple users are using the same login. If they've set up views, you would want to respect those views and just make new ones and not um, manipulate uh, other views. That would be the only or change the default. Or change the default, right. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, we've gone through pretty much the list. Um, I'll make note of all the questions here, uh, try to have them respond uh, to. Um, we hope to have the video available sometime next week so that um, we can you can go back and for a refresher or share this information with others. We'll try to split it up into segments that are perhaps you know ten minutes long and um, index them. Um, so thank you everybody for your attention, and uh, we look forward to doing business with you. Mark, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.